uh, I'm really honored uh, to be here. And first, to give a little bit of why I'm in University of Michigan. In 2000, I went back to China from Notre Dame. I graduated from University of Notre Dame. And that was the starting point for me to be fully engaged into contemporary art. Mm -hmm. And that was the call from my former, I mean, boyfriend, now the, the husband. And uh, I have been working in contemporary art since then. And, uh, but my experience with you, Mish, was long time ago. I didn't realize that. Because at that time, like back in 2002, I met two professors from uh, Talman College of urban planning architecture. They were setting up some summer program students to China. And I was bumping into them. I suggested, what about these students doing? And they said they are here for knowing about Chinese urban and rural economy and the, the architecture and planning thing. I said, why don't you integrate the art perspective? And so that's how I was involved. I was giving tours. I was guiding them to visit art studios. And later on, year by year, since 2002, and, but more formally since 2008, we have uh, different students from different <coughs> universities, like CUNY from New York, like uh, many other universities, Emerson from Florida, you know, and SciArc from California. So all these students were bum gathered together by UM professors uh, from the top men. And then I, that's why I was back then starting to be connected with UMish. I wasn't realizing that until I came here. I was signing up my into the school, and my UMish name was so easy to be scouted. I'm, all my records was in, in, the, in the documents uh, on the website. And that was amazing. And uh, I was very thankful for Joseph. And uh, during the last um, year, I have been oftentimes come over to listen to the talks. I benefit a lot. And I'm so happy that this is my, my day to just give you a short intro to the last three, you know, four decades of Chinese contemporary art movements. So from what point? There are so many artists, so many movements, and the domestic and global and international, all these genres are intermixed into Chinese art scenes. So where should I start? I was wondering. So I said, oh, being one of the insiders, just like, Joseph Lam was introducing, I was the insider. So I do see <coughs> quite a lot of artists moving from one media to another. And then they come over from you know, grappling with international and domestic tribes of political uh, you know, obedience or political rebellions, all these struggles. And then they somehow, after 20, 30 years, they came to you know, terms with themselves. That's why, you know, going political to going personal is like a natural trend. And plus, Chinese, uh, uh, you know, social, economic, and political, all these cultural phenomena are not that, you know, abrupting uh, extremely, like the, in the 70s, 80s, even the 90s. So we, in China, the, the, t the times now is coming like more intermingled into the global scene. So that's why I chose these two parallel lines. One is the, uh, the political, one is the personal. Uh, so I think uh, this is my interpretation. There are a lot of scholarly books on what is contemporary art. That's Terry Smith, a professor from some university, give a very specific talk, a series of uh, explanations about the theories on contemporary. This is my way of doing this. I think contemporary is, is all about everything, about who you are, what you are, and the where, why you are here. So it's about now, the current times. And the, it's of multi dimensions of art form. It can be oil painting, it can be drawing, it can be a, a sculpture, it can be a film, it could be a performance, it can be anything. And uh, it's a freestyle. It's like you do swimming, right? You can do freestyle, you can do all kinds of like, jumping or you know all these frog leaping the jumping you know swimming style but it's a very free style so don't give a clear cut definition onto contemporary it doesn't make sense so as long as you in, you involve all your senses you integrate your understandings you integrate your you know misunderstandings into this um, genre you get uh, some ideas so it sometimes involves uh, viewers Senses, it challenges you. 
Sometimes, like I said, uh, like uh, Joseph is saying, you should be a participant. You are not only a viewer. Side, you know, side, setting up on the line, you are watching as a viewer, but also you are a participant. Sometimes you could be a critic. So you, you are all participatory into these art um, activities. So the, the, two runner, uh, two, the two parallels um, I'm working on now is like political and personal. And contemporary art from China happens around you know, the end of the Cultural Revolution. So it's in the late 70s. And around that time, there were no professional artists whatsoever. There, these were the young beginners who just learned how to do drawings. They copied the, you know, the masters from Western art books. And then they went outside to the wilderness to paint grass, nature, you know, from the sky, stars, whatever, you know. It's a freestyle from the very beginning. So that's why we don't have professional artists in the late 70s, because all the schools were shut down, right? As you know, the Cultural Revolution stopped schooling from, you know, the, the young kids and uh, the youth. So in the 70s, after the liberation, after the Cultural Revolution, the, the government, you know, relaunched, uh, I mean, actually launched the first round of economic reform. So that, you know, staged the social, political and the cultural transformations all on stage in China. And so that's why there are so many personal experiences that touches upon each individual, and also there are so many political uprisings and uh, unrests that you know in, involved that makes the artists inspired. And uh, I want to use uh, Professor Wu Hong's uh, uh, theories on to what extent, from what levels to interpret Chinese contemporary art. And so he's saying there are like three spheres, you know, three spheres. One is like China's domestic space, right? That what's going on inside China. And then there's the global art network. You know, contemporary art or avant-garde art in the US that happens long time ago in the 60s, right? It's uh, like uh, along with the, the, the feminist movement, along with all these, you know, earlier, the, the rock and roll and the, all these populist movements in the 60s and 70s. And then there was the third level individual value, individual values. Where this artist was born, was his social background, was his family you know, lineage to art or not. And then that was his education, and along with the social movements in his schooling, in the education, all these spheres, you know, the immediate sphere of he, where he was, where he is now and the global and the, the network of uh, the Chinese contemporary art arena, the political, social, economic, cultural, these, all these dimensions. And then the third, third one is bigger, like rippling from the, the center, the focus of individual to the domestic, to the international. So this is uh, the way to understand. I'm not going to go over these vocabulary. I think these are you know, the uh, very succinct uh, conf uh, de definitions for the different genres and different movements, what can be uh, overarching to interpret Chinese contemporary art, but if you like, I could send out to you. And I want to give you a little bit back story about what has been going on. Uh, uh, many of you are probably Chinese scholars, you know what has happening, but I, I want to give you a little bit background because where we are now comes from where we were before. So like, uh, I want to start out from the founding of the People's Republic of China in 1949. Uh, so October 1st is the founding, and then we have the great, you know, these social movements and political events that, you know, has a strong impact on China. So that's why I brought it up here. And between 58 to 62, there was this great leap forward that was like Chinese uh, uh, rural economy going into you know, industrialization. So we had all these problems you know, rapidly transforming the country from uh, an agrarian communist socialist. You know? And then we have this cultural revolution, right? It's called the Great Proletarian Revolution. And uh, if some of you, if you know the Chinese uh, traditional artwork, we back then in the Ming and Qing, we had different, you know, scholarly, literary writings and literary paintings. Th those were like avoiding the direct conflicts, right? And they were like seeking, sitting in back 
and just enjoying themselves and trying to cultivate their own individual mentalities. And then in the 50s and 60s, we had this social movement and political unrest going on. The government tries to evoke people's passion. That's why we elicited new runners. It's like socialist, realist, you know, from the former Soviet Union. And then we want the artist the so-called artists, but they are, of course, like invited, commissioned by the government to do a lot of propaganda, you know, uh, posters thing. So that was the time, 60 and 66 to 76. And then there was this, you know, campaigns against this, campaigns against that. And so we had uh, the style that was about the uh, style, tall, grand, complete, red, bright, you know, those are the posters. You might have seen a lot of, you know, Cultural Revolution posters. Those, they, these are the key terms and shining upon what's, you know, the grandeur scale the government wants to, you know, popularize among the general people. So artists were like commissioned around that time by the government to serve the goods for the people at that time. And then we had, you know, Lin Biao, right, died of the. Uh, crash, the airplane crash, and so we had this anti-Confucius campaign afterwards. So we want to bulldoze, you know, demolish all the old things, and so we can set up a new thing to build up something, you know, that was totally new, so it can nurture the younger people to be more, you know, abiding by the, the social morals set up by the governments. And then we have, um, you know, all this, uh, that was the beginning. I would say in contemporary art actually starts until the end of the Cultural Revolution, but actually there was this uh, beginning, and there was these younger beginners, these like clandestine collectives. Those were students. They were mobilized by the government to you know, paint you know, posters, write like large character things, but at the, uh, their private time, in their spare time, they were gathered together, and they were like forming clandestine you know, small groups, and then they went out to paint. So th there was the, the beginning then of the Chinese contemporary art. And there was this artist called Collectives, called No Name. And they want to get rid of all these political campaigns, and they want to do art for the art's sake only. And uh, then they got inspiration. That was also the beginning of international, foreign, philosophy, literature, films, and all these museums, you know, compiled uh, archives and uh, catalogs were pulled into China around that time. So these artists, actually they were students, and they were inspired, and, and then they went through all this the international artist movement from, you know, romantic, you know, the earlier. Uh, a European Romantic, and then going to the Impressionist, post-Impressionist, and then they, they came over. All these general art trends in the West for decades. And then we had uh, come over to the birth of Chinese contemporary art. And then that was, you know, a very short uh, beginning uh, intro. And then I have to introduce you <coughs> Uh, you know, always, you know, there was this timeline, the political and goes with the personal. So 1976, on April 5th, that was the day when the Premier Joe was dead. And then, so there was a lot of photographers. They are unprofessional. They were like amateur photographers, just like the amateur painters in the early 1973. They gathered these uh, amateur photographers, they went over to Tiananmen, TM, they represent Tiananmen, they went then to mourn, you know, the contribution, and they were so frustrated, they didn't know where to go, so they were anguished about the, the disease. And then, but something happened, you know, the, the policemen came over and then they asked them to go. So, but the, anyhow, there were a piles of piles of archives of the photograph were kept very well. So actually, we should, if we say when is the beginning, we, sh we could trace to this no-name group. We could also pin down on this amateur photographer's exhibition that happens later. So this is also a small intro uh, to what's going on in the 70s, uh, late 70s. So there was this Mao died, 
right? And then there was a gang of four. That was the click click of the the bad four people. And then there that was like booming the reform, right? Coming in, and we have a so important 1978. That was the third plenary. You know, that's the CCPCC's uh, you know 11th uh, session, the Congress that starts to lead China into the right track, right? We were like re-formulating re, uh, what's going on, what will be happening in the next decades. So that was the important political convention going on in 78. And then 79, Jiang Feng is a so significant, he was like a, a, a president and the, the leader of promoting contemporary art. He said, let's get rid of art for the per political purpose. We, we have to evoke people's you know, freedom ex expression. So that's Jiang Feng. And then, like I said, the amateur photographer formulated. And they made a, the uh, first show, Nature, Society, and Man, so human beings. You can understand, right? The people were not happy about photography, political con conventions, you know, all these powerful leaders or the heroic, the so-called heroic acts, they were fed up with those, you know, pretentious, right? Pretentious, you know, agri, you know, grandifying those leaderships. And they want to go back to the nature, go back to the human beings. So this is like, oh, from the elitism or whatever, the government controlled art into political, politically uh, personal voices. So all these events happens, and then, but, you know, we had a, a, a so provocative small group of artists. They are the stars. They are the star movement beginners. Wang Keping, Ma Dezheng, Huang Rui, and also part of uh, uh, the team was also like around 13 people. I Bei Wu was one of them. So they formulate these stars exhibition, but their show was, of course, uh, again, closed down, and then they were allowed to uh, open again, and they were closed down again. So these artists were so angry, they launched a, a demonstration, a protest. So they went from a, this, this specific thing where to go. They have a uh, very clear route. They go through, you know, Xidan goes through the Tianmen, then they end up in, you know, the so-called like Zhongnanhai or somewhere, you know, so that they can make a strong voice against that. And the artists were like having banners. So actually, if you look at Chinese uh, past decades history, there were not many times artists or students like to you know, go on the street. There were not many, right? But always Tiananmen is the key, key presentation about all these uh, protests. OK, there was a lot of history to go. And um, yeah, I have to say, 80s was the, the, the thrust, new thrust that comes through that brings out the outburst of Chinese contemporary movements. So we have the, we call it art spring, the spring of art. You know, it's like uh, the new beginning. It's, it's frozen. We, we describe that was those old times like frozen, you know, dead times. And now it's like a new spring that people come back to life. And we also have the political liberalization programs going on. So we have all these artists, you know, they made very, you know, touching and individualistic uh, works. I'm going to show you. Maybe we can, you know, just explain a quite bit, and then we can go over to see the images. So there was the scar art. If you heard about scar, you know, scar art. There is also scar literature. There was also scar films around 1980s. So those was like people's reflections about what has been going on in this country during the Cultural Revolution. You know, people's mentality, people's moods were subdued, and there was nothing people can you know express. And especially, it's like the Cultural Revolution uh, diminished uh, the dreams of the younger people. So that was the beginning of younger artists, younger writers, younger younger filmmakers to think about what has been going on. So we are going back to social list movements, but we are also thinking about to what direction we are going. You know, we are thinking about using sentimental and symbolic ways of expression to determine, you know, humanism is the way to go. And then so we are going to go over those works a little bit. And then the you know of course, you know, we reflect and then we condense 
and then we contemplate what's you know what has been the frustrations, where where is the new thrust going forward. So those are the other word or other artworks. So this is a very significant in the early 1980s. So we have scar. You have seen the young people being frustrated. They were like bloodshed going on, you know, coming from the wudou, right? The fights between different factions of young people. You know, it's not the, the seniors; it's the young people they're fighting. And you know, there was like a pictorial. There was very well-known pictorial. You know, a series of photos and drawings talking about what has been going on in between a, a pair of lovers. You know, the man, the young man, the young woman. They were lovers, but they belong to different factions. And then they, they had to kill each other, you know, that was a pictorial. So that was the beginning about people think about, you know, love, where is love being lost, you know. So I'm, I'm going, yeah, this is the work. Yeah, the image wasn't very clear. So you can see Cheng Chongling, he was actually inspired by this the scar, uh, the pictorial about the lovers and so you see this is a young woman that's uh, his boyfriend and they belong to one faction and she was uh, arrested and then those were, were the younger people you know the red guards right and then you know 1978 Cheng Chongling's work snow on some day and some months 1968 so that was bleakly telling you what the reality is all about and then we have also Gao Xiaohua describing, you know, this, you know, after the harassment, after the chaos, you know, these kids, young, young enough, not knowing where to go, what has happened, and they were, you know, sitting down and so tired, and they were figuring out, you know, thinking. So these are like parallel images about the frustrations. And so we talk about these um, star groups, right? Yeah, Wang Keping has been very outspoken you know he was he wasn't very well trained in contemporary he was like uh, self-educated also so he got a block block chunks of wood and then he just cut out the, the, the faces the contours and then you know there's Mao right he you know blind you know like very briefly just describe Mao as like a god, like an idol, you know, but he stretched stretch out his face like very, you know, flat, and not like what we describe as Mao is, uh, you know, flourishing faces. And then there was this, this can be any one of, so your eyes and your mouth were blocked, right? You're blindfolded and then you were, you were stuck with a chunk of, you are not able to speak up, basically. So because you are so, mindlessly believing in this idol so it's like you are blocking yourself from seeing and feeling and talking but uh, Wang Keping was a uh, was one of the very outspoken in the star movement but he had to leave he forced to leave he fled the country in the 80s and then he had been living in France for some time so that was the destiny of many younger many young artists in the 80s so there was like also, these are the, I, I was talking to you, right? The, this is like kind of like what's going on during the people come back to think about, oh, those were the, you know, the uh, very great leadership being admired and cherished and, uh, and uh, looked up to. And uh, here, Luo Zhongli, you know, he one day, he was talking about why he was making these oil paintings. And he was, one the, he was one of the younger uh, students being sent out to the countryside, right, to, do, to be re-educated. And he walked on and he saw this uh, poor peasant, you know, squatting down. He, what, who is he? He was like the guy, cleaner, who, who cleaned up those toilets, public toilets. This old man in the, in the New Year, the, in the New Year's Eve, this old man was so, you know, cold and so was, you know, no, nowhere to go. And he was just squatting down and then, this artist went out and he saw him sitting down there and then, you know, this face and he said, he wants to give a couple of names to this painting, but he was saying at last he, he figured out that's the title, you know, father. Father is any one of our father, right? Can be your father, can be my father. You know, that's where we were from. Uh, China used to be, like I said, an agra agrarian economy, right? We are all from the countryside. My grandparents, even my parents come from the countryside. So we cannot avoid that. So this is like paying tribute as well to this um, 
uh, any one of us, you know, our ancestors, our grandparents, to the human, giving, giving honor to the civilians, to the people, to the general one, any, anyone in general. You know. Is that medium a uh, photo? Or it's a painting. Oh, wow. it's, it's like a realistic, very realistic, right? Super realistic painting. You, Chuck Close, you know, right? The Chuck Close is the U.S. and yeah, he, you know, he was also kind of like uh, influenced. Yeah, there was a lot of links about Chinese uh, literary paintings and to this uh, figurative and the uh, abstract, and then we have these realistic paintings. So there was, you know, this image wasn't very clear. You can see the wrinkles, right? And you can also see the uh, worn-out bowl. But actually, you, you missed that. There was like a pen, um, put it here. Because one of the people they were critiquing, critiquing on this painting said, oh, you know, in that times, we shouldn't say those were like, you know, poor peasants. We have to enlighten people with something hopeful. So that's why this artist was asked by his critique to paint a pen, you know. Pen means you are educated, right? You, at least you are on the way to be educated. So actually, there was a pen uh, on this side. And He Duolin is, uh, all these amazing artists come from Sichuan, you know, from the very beginning. We have very brilliant students, you know, rebelling against the government in the uh, 70, late 70s from Beijing, but also those younger painters, they graduated from Sichuan, was very good painters. These are the works, like, you know, this, there is, uh, we were talking about art history class, and there was a whiff. W-Y-E-T-H, there was this American artist who paints something like that, you know, like idyllic uh, pastoral life, you know, people just enjoying them on the grassland, right? So this was, but it's a meaning, it's a, it has a deep meaning, it means spring wind, like the, you know, connotation, like this term, um, metaphorizing, you know, the new spring is coming. We are hopeful for what's what awaking, awaiting us. Spring wind has uh, arrived. So that was like a very, you know, all these, uh, all these works I'm showing you has, uh, has been very well published and they were making a lot of mo money on the auction markets. Then, at, like, <laughs> Natsu knows all this history, right? We were talking about impressionist, post-impressionist, modernist, and post-modernist, and then all the way to avant-garde, and contemporary art, and then this is Dadaism, right? Dada is also like destructive, you know. What's that word called? I, I couldn't remember, but it's like destructing everything. And this was the Xiamen artists, that they were also, you know, fed up with this museum system. They don't want to show in the museum, in the gallery, in any art spaces. And so they gathered all their painter, paintings, and the, on the, out, uh, in the open air, they put on fire, they burned out. So it's like uh, Huang Yongping, uh, I, I'm just amazed at how much, you know, these resources and inspiration these artists come springing out from his mind. He's a, he's a marvelous artist and he lived in Paris. He represents Paris for the Venice Biennial. He's a brilliant artist. And uh, luckily in November last year, three months ago, two months ago, I, I'm very happy that the uh, History of Art Department says, sponsored us, and me and uh, another nine students, we went over to Guggenheim Museum in New York. That, that show art and China after, after revolution, after 1989, that's, that's not a revolution. And the theater of the world, theater of the world was Huang Yongping's artwork being presented a couple of times in different countries. In Canada, he was asked to, you know, people were having a lot of, uh, tries around his work. They don't like his work because his works were using a lot of animals, different animals, snakes, <coughs> whatsoever, all the scorpions. Mm -hmm. Theater of the world means, you know, the whole world of human beings are like the animals world, right? We are eating each other. We are conquering each other. We are just diminishing each other. And he used uh, hundreds of uh, different animals from large to small and put them into like kind of like display. And you can see, you know, you feed them well, but they are still fighting, and they, they, that's like a natural food chain, right? They eat on each other to survive themselves. 
And then so his work was, uh, um, was boycotted. They don't want to show his work. So he was very smart. On the way from the airplane from Paris to New York, he picked out uh, kind of like, you know, the vomit bag, right, on the airplane. He wrote down his feelings, you know, you know, American viewers or the audience, they sign up on Facebook, or Twitter, whatever. So there, there was like more than, I think more than one million people signing up to, to boycott his work, showing not only his and other artists were, they, they were like, uh, claiming these are the work like abusing the animals, you know, they are, you know, violating the animal rights, whatever. So he wrote what he feels about this in those, what's that bag called? Like, you know, that, that he displayed. Instead of the work, there was like a whole vacancy, right? You were there before, and again, yeah. So the show was like, um, was like uh, showing nothing about this dramatic work and it's, um, very pivotal, but, but it's uh, just boycotting. And actually, uh, after this talk, uh, I can show you a clip if we have time. There was a CNN style. It's uh, documenting what has been going on in during the show and how the artists reflect about the old, old days. Yeah, we come on to the 90s. What's going on in China in the late 80s? You know about that. Right? The Berlin Wall fall, right? The, uh, the Soviet bloc was over. You know, everything was demol demolished in the late 89. And there was these student movements. Oh, we missed one more. We don't want to talk about student movement, right? We want to talk about art. And in, 80, in 89, February, you know, like nine, something around the same year, say same time now, there was this Chinese New Year. And in the National Museum of Art, Beijing, there was staged a big grandiose contemporary art show organized by Gao Minglu, you know, Liu Xiaochun and Li Xianting, all these people. And there were uh, uh, more than 300 artists being shown in the Namok. And there, w there was this art piece you know, presented by a woman artist you know, making an installation about uh, the fo uh, phone booth uh, with his image from the back, and there was his boyfriend's uh, image. There was a photo booth, and uh, the government regulation saying you were not supposed to do anything performance art. And then these artists, of course, they sneakingly they they knew what they would do it. And then so this woman came in after the opening, and it was like. There was a no U-turn, you know, it's like a breakthrough show. There was no U-turn, it means we have no way to go back. And then it was like, like hallucinating. There was like black, you know, black, like usually we have red carpet, right? They, they've piled up the black booth with the U-turn uh, on the plaza in, in front of the, and then they go in and there was the artists, there was some people, you know, marvelous, they sell, they sell those shrimps. They sell shrimps, you know, in the winter of the middle. You know, there, Beijing people like eating shrimp, but there was no shrimps, you know. That was also the meager times. We are not self-sufficient to make money, and we are all relying on the government to support us. And the livelihood was poor, and then this artist from uh, Fujian Promise, he imported or buying from some, you know, black markets, and then some shrimps, stinky shrimps. He was selling shrimps there. And there, there was an artist who were like uh, hatching eggs. You know, he's, uh, he's sitting down on the raw eggs and hatching eggs. Don't bother, I'm hatching eggs. Mm -hmm. And there was also some artists using the condom, you know, like to you know, make big deal of installations. There was also, you know, artists like throwing condoms all over the places. And uh, the government people were, were so, Frustrated, and they came over. Just around that time, there was like two gunshots. You heard about two gunshots in '89. That was like, you know, the beginning. We are talking about the later student movement, right? That was like leading, like predator. What's that? Pre, predicament for the future younger people. It means, yeah, but actually, these artists, the woman artists and the male artists, they were partners at around that time, they had arguments. They don't go into each other's ideas. And then she was angry, she, and they somehow got a gun from a soldier's grandson, you know, a high leader, uh, army leaders. They have guns in their home. So this young man, you know, he's just my neighbor, 17, when he was 17 years old, 
he stole his grandpa's gun and give over to this woman artist performer. And then they fired two gunshots. So that, you know, that was like big deal. So that's the whole show was closed down. So that's why I'm saying these artists, you know, coming through 89, they knew what has been going on. You know, 80s, from say exactly from 80, 78 to 88, well, that was 10 years that like enlightenment, you know, inspiration, good times, you know, the government was loose uh, on, you know, gripping over the people's mentality. We have uh, all the economies going back to track, industrialization is going on. And, uh, but suddenly we, ha well, we do have like anti this, anti that campaigns, right? We anti this uh, capitalist, uh, right? bourgeoisie, you know, all these lifestyles, all this uh, freestyle, freedom of speech, all we have this campaign, but we do have artists being inspired by the earliest, you know, uh, books and films, literature, all these catalogs, art things. And uh, the 89 is like the, the end of it. So 10 years, so, you know, mm, a life, a live environment, for giving artists a rise to expressions uh, of themselves. But 89 was like the end of it, you know, cut. And then the artists who just graduated from 89, many artists graduated from art schools, not only artists, but many students coming out from the school, college, they were not given any jobs. They were not given any jobs. I was a sophomore at around that. I, I wasn't too much influenced, but I knew our seniors, they were not giving any job. But around the 80s and 90s, even beginning of 90s, all the students who graduated from co are supposed to be, right, to be offered government or you know, corporate some kind of jobs to make a living. But those years was like, uh, so these artists graduated, had no job, and he had to find a shelter. So these artists, along with many other artists, poets, writers, whatsoever, they, they didn't have nowhere to go. So where they go? In Beijing, they went over to Yuan Mingyuan. You know, Yuan Mingyuan was adjacent just to Peking University, to Tsinghua University, all these, uh, you know, big schools. And so they had those there in, you know, because of cheap rent, right? And because of those, uh, you know, immediacy to, to receive, uh, you know, the news and the information. So they had over there and then somehow, they were exposed to these foreign express, foreign press people, you know, embassies, uh, you know, foreign journalists, overseas uh, visits. So they were interviewed, and so they made a big name around the early eight, 90s. And so this work was actually appeared in the Times magazine. So people interpreted it differently. Uh, Chinese people say, oh, they, we were fed up with what you were telling us we were n not caring about what you are telling us. So it's like an uh, en enlightenment thing. We are coming back to ourselves. So we are also in the early 90s, you know, Mao goes back. Mao goes back not as a leadership, as a but as a pop figure. You know, Mao's image was used on keychains, on many celebrated you know, festive uh, you know, memor uh, souvenirs. So Mao goes pop, we say, around that time. But uh, the foreigners interpret this imagery as, uh, oh, they were crying out for freedom. They were crying out for democracy, <laughs> so, so it's like two interpretations. One is subdued, right, subdued. And the other is like, you know, going out, you know, speak up. And uh, I'm, I'm giving you a little bit show about uh, the major artworks, you know, around these uh, decades. Zhang Xiaogang also, of course, every one of, I don't know, Every one of us in 1680, we had these family portraits. Mm -hmm. But look at his for family. Every one of us is about same, right? Same face, same same mood, same expressions. Except you know the younger generation had these you know colorful faces, and all their eyes are lo looking like they they were sick, right? They were sick with some you know their eyes were not concentrating or focusing. So the Bloodline series, it's also talking about those uh, old times people's mindset were restrained from doing expressions. And like I said, going pop, right, in the 90s. And uh, Wang Guangyi made this uh, whole series about great criticism. And we have uh, 
Rosenberg show going in to China and the Namok. Uh, we have a different, you know, uh, general, uh, well-known international artist coming to China. And uh, we have, uh, who else? We have a um, French artist, the duo artist, uh, what's his name? Not Pierre and Gilles, that was like, a very, uh, Gilbert and George. They also visit China. So, and uh, many other retrospective from international artists also came to China. So this, this work, you see these are using the revolutionary, right? Cultural revolutionary figures and uh, you know, the ways of expressions are exactly the same, but he juxtaposed those uh, pop, you know, the grand, grand uh, icons of conglomerates in China. And those numbers you see anywhere, but it doesn't make any sense. It just creates this, you know, disharmony into the image. Yeah, of course, Mao. And, but actually, Li Shan, we had a video that interviews Li Shan. As Li Shan was a very self-meditative uh, artist. He has made a whole series about Mao and goose thing, you know, like obedient animals. And then he was saying he doesn't want to either glorify or diminish the leadership. He wants to just give the leadership who he is as a human being. So even though the, the, you know, the red represents China, but Mao here is in, in the 30s during the Red Army times was described very faithfully, but not as, you know, grandiously. How much time do we have? Mm -hmm. Seven minutes. Seven minutes. Okay, so I will be very brief. And so those were the before the 2000, right? 90s, 80s, 70s, we have all these marvelous uh, landmark pieces. And later on, you know, as I said, the domestic sphere was like frustrating, struggling out. Artists individually has to seek for their own expressions. And then the 2000 opens up the whole door to the international arena. So Chinese contemporary goes global also. And we have foreign, you know, expertise coming in. We have foreign architects, you know, all these scientists are all over in China making contributions. But the new thing is we artists develop new runners. They don't stick through only with painting, uh, f uh, sculptures or drawing or what. So they develop new runners, it's, um, new ways of expression. They use photography for performances. So I'm going to show you, you can get the idea, right? These are the bloody animals which were, you know, killed <laughs> and the, that was the forbidden city. So all these artists are also using uh, the earlier painter, painterly ways to express, you know, the ways uh, people are getting frustrated, are getting, you know, endangered, and they were, even though they were offered all the good things, you know, the jewelry things, but they, they are, you know, all the, and uh, the new way of photography also starts from the documentary first documentary and uh, provocative performative pieces all the way on to analytical and performative. This one was unique. Lu Hao was a Beijing native, so he made this whole series of plexiglass sculpture, sculpturally works. No, in China we said all what the, the Beijing needs like to do. They do they don't do much thing. They like they don't like to talk about anything politics. They they just loiter around the street, they they, they treat their birds and they enjoy themselves. So these were like uh, how these artists interpret what the, the government all these regimes were doing, you know, the uh, celebrate this is the people's hall, right? That was uh, the, na the National Museum, that was the Zhongnan Hail, that was like the Forbidden City. So this artist was quite critical, like the cr uh, cynical, realist uh, artists. And then there was, uh, yeah, this is Wang Jingsun, he's going over his works next week. So I'm going, I'm, I just um, try to uh, make uh, narratives uh, clear to you how and uh, what ways artists are developing from painting, you know, sculpture, all the way to performance and photography. So this was like a, a comparative study about the old and new times in relation to what the intellectuals were doing or they can or they can do. So we will see this work in the art lounge next week.
Yeah, uh, when Joseph talks about the monuments in China, in many other countries, especially in the, this uh, uh, socialist country, you oftentimes you see many monuments, right? Histories, monuments. If you go last week, yeah, in CNN there was this guy who uh, the U.S. young uh, journalist they made a documentary about North Korea. So I saw that document. It was amazing. You know, everywhere you go, you see the Kim's family mm -hmm. <laughs> sculptures all over the places. Yeah, there was the follow me. So that was talks about you know the 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 Chinese dream. You know, we want to go global. We want to engage with the world. And this is like what I interpret as Fanghua, right? Where we were before, you know, 70s, 80s, late, and then yeah. where we are now, like, the, making a comparison between the, and then so you see the times going by and you see someone get, you know, sick, and then some artists also using everyday news, you know, this was a news, in China, newspaper is a big deal in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, even early 2000s. Now we have all these right, cell phones you read, so you don't, but in the old days we have all the big deals, big events, big news were published in these uh, four national holiday, uh, national newspapers. Xin Jinbao was kind of like more democratic. And then they show some uh, civilian lifestyles and civilian everyday common lives. Mm -hmm. So that was uh, mm, the news about this small mini car could be you know, going on the Tiananmen Square. Years ago, it wasn't. Now it was. Now it was not allowed in, uh, again because it's like uh, pollution, right? Whatever. Okay, so I'm gonna wrap up, right? Yeah, there are something to show you. Yeah, I want to explain a little bit. Maybe possibly uh, in 2019, January to February, we will invite this artist also. He's a very this is the way I say he's very think uh, thoughtful artist. He applies many performative actions, and he is very brave in putting himself in danger. He is challenging himself, his body, his you know endurance capacities. So you will see some of his works here, but he's a very uh, honorable artist, and if you see him, you will find out that he, uh, that's his daily life, that's w his life, and he cho chops wood every day. Okay. That's also his art. So this is the thing I want you to see. <laughs> that was a little joke. Art in China, so there was uh, this CNN mm, report about the show in Guggenheim. I think 20 minutes, you get the gist of Chinese contemporary art. You, know, there you have three, um, you have the curator's perspective, you have the artist's perspective. So it's a very good way. If you Google CN Art in China style, you find that clip. It's twen 23 minutes, it's very good. So you will be given a lot of uh, background information about art. Thank you for your patience. <laughs>